I suppose that some of you have read a very fascinating work that was written many years ago by C.G. Jung, a commentary that he wrote to a translation of a Chinese classic by Richard Wilhelm called The Secret of the Golden Flower. Now, you may remember that in that commentary, he takes up the very fascinating problem of the dangers inherent in the adoption of uh, Oriental ways of life by Westerners, uh, but more particularly the adoption of Oriental spiritual practices such as yoga. And I remember I learned a great deal from that essay and appreciated it very much in ever so many ways because even in my own fascination with forms of Oriental philosophy I have never been tempted to forget that I'm a Westerner but as I think this essay over I'm not sure that Jung discouraged the practice of yoga by Westerners for quite the right reasons. I find so often the difficulty in Jung's ideas lies in his theory of history, which is, I feel, a hangover from 19th century theories of history uh, encouraged by Darwinism namely that there's a sort of orderly progression from the ape through the primitive to the civilized man. And of course, naturally at that time, that was all hitched in with the theory of progress. And it was highly convenient for the cultures of Western Europe, which were then a one up on everybody else, to consider themselves in the van of progress. And when they visited the natives of Borneo and Australia and so on, be able to feel that they were perfectly justified in appropriating their lands and dominating them because they were giving them the benefits of the last word in evolution. And uh, therefore, under the influence of that sort of theory of history, which is felt in the work of both Freud and Jung, one gets the feeling of there being a kind of progressive development of human consciousness. And Jung is charitable enough to assume that because the Chinese and Indian civilizations are immeasurably older than ours, they've had the, poss the possibility of far more sophistication in psychic development. Even though he feels, and probably rightly, that there are things they can learn from us. But the reason why he discourages the Westerner from the practice of yoga is that he says this is a discipline for a far older culture than ours, which along certain lines has progressed much further and has learned certain things that we haven't mastered at all yet. And thus he points out that when somebody embraces uh, Vedanta or Theosophy or any yoga school in the West and tries to master a discipline of concentration in which uh, they have to oust from their consciousness all wandering thoughts. He says that this for a Westerner may be a very dangerous thing indeed because just exactly what the Westerner may need to do is to allow free reign to his wandering thoughts and his imagination and his fantasy because it's only in this way that he can get in touch with his unconscious and uh, that his unconscious will not leave him in peace until he gets in touch with it. He assumes the members of Oriental cultures have done this long before they went in for yoga practice. Now, I don't think this is quite true. But I do think there are other reasons why Western people need to exercise a good deal of discrimination and caution in adopting Eastern disciplines and ways of life. In other words, it's rather like the problem of taking medicine. 
You know, if you don't feel very well and you go to a friend's medicine cabinet and you sort of look it over and see bottles of medicine in there and uh, you say, I'm sick, I need medicine, so you take some medicine. Any medicine will do. Well, it won't. And uh, according to what's the matter with you, so the medicine has to be prescribed. And I don't think that the things which some of the Eastern disciplines are designed to cure are quite the same things that we need. Now, it's fundamental to my view of the nature of such forms of discipline as Buddhism and Taoism that they are ways of liberation from a specific kind of confinement. That is to say, they're ways of liberation from what I've sometimes called the social hypnosis. In other words, every culture, every society, as a group of people in communication with each other, has certain rules of communication. And from culture to culture, these rules differ in just the same way that languages differ. And a culture can hold together on very, very different kinds of rules. I won't say any kinds of rules, but very different kinds of rules, always provided that the members agree about them, whether they are forced to agree, whether they agree tacitly, or whatever the reason may be. And these rules are, in a way, very much like the rules of a game. In other words, uh, take a game like chess. You can have the kind of chess we play with an eight-square board, or you can have a kind of chess that the Japanese play with a nine-square board. Uh, it doesn't make any difference so long as you both play on the same board and by the same rules. But sim this is a chess as a game, and in the same way, the development of human cultures is also, in a way, a game. That is to say, it's the elaboration of a form of life. And the fun of it, in a way, is the fun of elaborating it in just some interesting form. That's the same as the fun of a game. The fun of a game is it has a certain interest. But it doesn't follow that the rules of the game correspond to the actual structure of human nature or to the laws of the universe. But because in every culture it's necessary to impress upon especially its younger members that these rules jolly well have to be kept, they are usually in some way or other connected with the laws of the universe and given some sort of divine sanction. And there are indeed cultures in which the senior members of the group realize that that's a hoax, that that's as if it's a made up and is done to terrify the young. And when they uh, become senior members of the culture themselves, they see through the thing, but they don't uh, let on, they keep it quiet. They don't let out to those who are supposed to be impressed that this was really a hoax to get them to behave. Well, anyway... After a great deal of careful study, I've come to the conclusion that the function of these ways of liberation is basically to make it possible for those who have the determination, and we'll see why in a while, to make it possible for those who have the determination to be free from the social hypnosis. In other words, if you were a member of the culture of India, at almost any time between maybe 900 BC and 1800 AD, it would be for you a matter of common sense about which everybody agreed that you were under the control of a process called karma, not exactly a law of cause and effect, but a process of cosmic justice 
whereby every fortune that occurred to you would be the result of some action in the past that was good, and every misfortune that occurred to you would be the result of some action in the past that was evil. And furthermore, that this action in the past might not have been done in this present life, but in a former life. It was simply axiomatic to those people that they were involved in a long, long process of reincarnation, reaping the rewards and punishments. And there were not only there was not only the possibility of being reincarnated again in the human form, but if you were exceedingly good, you might be born in one of the heavens, the paradises, and if you were exceedingly bad, you might be born for an insufferable period of years, not forever, in a purgatory. Uh, and the purgatories of the Hindus and Buddhists are just as ingeniously horrible as those of the Christians. Well, of course... Everybody knows, I, I mean, anybody seems to have any sense, that all this uh, imagination of post-mortem courts of justice is a way of telling people, well, if the secular police don't catch you, the celestial police will catch you, and therefore you had better behave. And it's an ingenious device for encouraging uh, ethical conduct. Now, but remember that for a person brought up in that climate of feeling where everybody believes this to be true, it seems a matter of sheer common sense that it's so. And it's very difficult for a person so brought up not to believe that that is the state of affairs. Take an equivalent situation in our own culture. It's still enormously difficult for most people to believe that space may not be Newtonian space, that is to say, a three-dimensional continuum which extends indefinitely forever. The idea of a four-dimensional curved space seems absolutely fantastic and can't even be conceived by people unversed in uh, the mathematics of modern physics. Or again... As I've often pointed out, it's very difficult for us to believe that the forms of nature are not made of some stuff uh, called matter. Uh, that's a very unnecessary idea from a strictly scientific point of view, but it's awfully difficult for us to believe it. To believe, in other words, that there isn't this underlying stuff. And uh, not so long ago, it was practically impossible for people to conceive that the planets did not revolve about the Earth encased in crystalline spheres. And it took a very considerable shaking of the imagination when astronomers began to point out that this need not necessarily be so. All right, so now let's go back to the problem of somebody living in the culture of ancient India. Here it is, as a matter of common sense, you see, that he is going to be reborn. Now, there's some, perhaps, exceedingly intelligent person who, for one reason or another, discovers that this idea is not so. After all, when uh, you get such disciplines as Vedanta and Buddhism, they say that the ultimate goal of the discipline is release from the rounds of rebirth, and incidentally also, which is fundamental to it, release from the illusion that you are a separate individual confined to this body. But so far as both of these things are concerned, they also say that the person who is liberated from the round of rebirth, as well as from the illusion of being an ego, sees, when he is liberated, that the process of rebirth and the whole cosmology of reincarnation and karma, as well as the individual ego, are in a way illusions. 
That is to say, he sees that they are maya. And I would like to translate maya at this moment, not so much illusion, as a playful construct, a social institution. So he sees, you see, that those things are not so. They are only pretended to be so. And you see, he ceases to believe in karma and reincarnation and all that in exactly the same way that a modern agnostic no longer believes in the resurrection of the body at the day of judgment. I, I know this to be so because although you will get very many Hindus and Buddhists who say that they believe in reincarnation and come over here and teach it as part of the doctrine of Vedanta or Buddhism, the, the most sophisticated and the most profound, I'll say perhaps profound rather than, than sophisticated, Buddhists that I have known have said that they don't believe in it literally at all. And so I could say that those who do believe in it believe in it simply because it's part of their culture and they've not yet been able to be liberated from it. And so it seems to me very funny indeed when Western people who become interested in Vedanta or Buddhism, that is to say, in forms of discipline to liberate Hindus and uh, Chinese people from certain social institutions. Western people adopt it and then also adopt the ideas of reincarnation and karma from which these systems were designed to liberate them. Uh, of course, they adopt them because they feel it's consoling that one will go on living, and that wasn't the point at all. Or that it explains something, that why one suffered in this life was not because the universe was unjust, but because you committed some misdeed in the past. And so... Westerners who take up the Oriental doctrines in that spirit unfortunately take up the very illusions from which these doctrines were supposed to be ways of deliverance. Now, that may be difficult to see just because so many practicing Hindus and Buddhists say they believe in reincarnation and this whole process of the cycles of karma and so on. And uh, they, after all, are practicing it and they should know. Well, now look here, there's a certain good reason why they shouldn't. Of course, I'm making an exception of the Indian or Chinese who's been educated in, in Western style. And he ceases to believe, maybe, in the cosmologies of his own culture. But he's not liberated in the Buddhist sense because in receiving a Western education he's become a victim of our social institutions instead. And then he's just exchanged, uh, as it were, one trouble for another. But uh, when you take the situation as it stands, or as it did stand in India, isolated from Western culture, Obviously, no society can tolerate within its own borders the existence of a, a way of liberation, a way of seeing through its institutions uh, without feeling that such a way constitutes a threat to law and order. Anybody who sees through the institutions of society and sees them for, as it were, creative fictions in the same way as a novel or a work of art is a creative fiction, uh, anybody who sees that, of course, could be regarded by the society as a potential menace. But th then you may ask, well, if, if Buddhism and, and Vedanta and so on were indeed ways of liberation, how could Indian or Chinese society or Burmese society have tolerated their presence? Well, the answer lies simply in 
the much misunderstood esotericism of these disciplines. In other words, that those who taught them, the masters of these disciplines, made it incredibly difficult for uninitiated people to get in on the inside. And their method of initiating them, in a way, was to put them through trap after trap after trap to see if they could find their way through. In other words, uh, such a master would not dream of beginning by disabusing the neophyte and saying, well, you know, all these things you heard from your father and mother and teachers and so on were fairy tales. Oh, no, indeed. Uh, he would do what is called in Buddhism exercise the use of upaya, the Sanskrit word meaning skillful devices or skillful means, sometimes described as giving a child a yellow leaf to stop it crying for gold. After all, when you approach one of these ways of liberation from the outside, it looks like something very, very fantastic. Here you are, literally, going to be released from a literally true and physical cycle of endless incarnations in heavens and hells and all kinds of states. And therefore, naturally, to do that, what an undertaking that must be. What a wonderful, extraordinary person you've got to become. And so the neophyte is ready for almost anything. And the teacher, because the, the fundamental problem in this whole thing is for him to get rid of the illusion, you see, that he's a separate ego. If there's no separate ego or sort of soul, then there's nothing to be reincarnated. So all the teacher really, in, he has all kinds of complicated ways of doing it, but all that he really says to him is, well now, um, if you will look deeply into your ego, you will find out that it is a non-ego, that your self is the universal self, as he might say if he were a Vedantist. Or if he were a Buddhist, he might say, if you look for your ego, you won't find it. So look for it, and see, and uh, really go into it. And so he gets the man meditating, and trying by his ego to get rid of his ego. Well, that is a beautiful trap. It can last forever, until one sees through it. In other words, this is like trying to uh, you know, sweep the darkness out of a room with a broom. Or it's like, uh, it's worse than that. Uh, Lao Tzu, uh, Zhuang Tzu rather, had a nice figure for it. Beating a drum in search of a fugitive. That's to say, you know, when the police go out because they've had a telephone call that there's a burglar, they uh, come racing to the house with a siren full blast and the burglar hears it and runs away. Because, of course, to try and get rid of the ego for one's advantage in some way is an egotistic enterprise, and you can't do it. And so, of course, the student gets to the point where he begins to realize that everything he does to get rid of his ego is egotistic. And uh, this is the kind of trap in which the teacher gets him. Until, of course, he comes to the point of seeing that uh, his supposed division from himself into, say, I and me, the controller, controlling part of me and the controlled part of me, the knower and the known and all that, is, is phony. There is no way of standing aside from yourself 
in other words, and as it were, changing yourself in that way. But he discovers this finally. And at the same time, he discovers, uh, almost at the last minute, you might say, the fallacy, or rather the fantasy nature, the game-like nature of the system of cosmology which has existed to, as it were, underpin or give the basic form of the social institutions of his particular culture or society. In other words, you may put it in, a, in, in another way. One of the basic things which all social rules of convention conceal is what I would call the fundamental fellowship between yes and no. Say, in the Chinese symbolism of the positive and the negative, the yang and the yin. You know, you've seen that symbol of them together like two interlocked fishes. Well, the great game, I mean, the whole pretense of most societies is that these two fishes are involved in a battle. There's the up fish and the down fish, the good fish and the bad fish. And there's out for a killing. And the white fish is one of these days going to slay the black fish. But uh, when you see into it clearly, you realize that the white fish and the black fish go together. They're twins. They're really not fighting each other. They're dancing with each other. That, you see, though, is a difficult thing to realize. In a set of rules in which yes and no are the basic and formally opposed terms, when it is explicit in a set of rules that yes and no, or positive and negative, are the fundamental principles, it is implicit but not explicit that there is this fundamental bondage or fellowship between the two. The fear is, you see, that if people find that out, they won't play the game anymore. I mean, supposing a, a certain social group finds out that its enemy group, uh, which it's supposed to fight, is really uh, symbiotic to it. That is to say, the enemy group fosters the survival of the group by pruning its population. We'd never do to admit that. We'd never, never do to admit the advantage of the enemy, just as George Orwell pointed out in his uh, Fantasy of the Future 1984, that uh, as dictatorial government has to have an enemy, and if there isn't one, it has to invent one. And uh, by this means, by having something to fight, you see, having something to compete against, the energy of society to go on doing its job is stirred up. And what the Buddha or Bodhisattva type of person fundamentally is, is one, he's one who's seen through that, who doesn't have to be stirred up by hatred and fear and competition to go on with the game of life.